right, so moving forward. Um, I do not want to go paragraph by paragraph again, like I said earlier, but I thought that, where was I? Oh no, I lost my place. I lost my underlines. Oh, you were talking about, and I, I didn't find it, but you were talking about moving from low paying job to low paying job. And I think that, you know how we can, we can talk about anything. I think that the, um, the misconception for some people is that the struggle comes because you're, you're working a low wage job or, um, or you don't have um, the means to make it. Mm -hmm. But at times, like in my situation, I was a teacher. I had the means, but I didn't have the know-how, you know, Mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't know how to manage my money and pay this and this and that. And I had bought a house. I had a baby. I was like, from the outside looking in, everybody thought that everything was great, but nobody really came to see what was going on in my struggle, you know? Um, so I think that, my struggle came because I was a single parent who had to go to my son's dad and be like, hey, this gas bill, I got up to $400 this winter because I don't like to be cold. So I'm going to need you to, you know, come on over and help us out, even though you don't live here. It happens, you know, but I think that that had not to do with me uh, working a low paying job, but not having the knowledge in my youth in order to take care of my responsibilities, which made my struggle a little bit different. However, just as hard, you know? So I thought that was something to bring up when I was reading that. It made me think back on that. That's good. That's really good. Because here's the thing, like, you know, you and I both were single moms, but, you know, our experience, our experiences were different. You know, there are some things that you and I can relate on. There are some things, you know, we've had conversations and we can only give each other our perspective you know, which enlightens us. But guess what? There are single moms out there who have had a similar or the same experience that I have, but there are those who have had your experience. And guess what? They still need that uplifting. They may still be in a place where they still don't have that know-how. You know, they're still trying to figure it out. Two single moms trying to figure it out, you know, just trying to figure it out from a different vantage point, you know? So I think that that's a very good perspective to bring up because you're right. You know, in my case, you know, mine was like, you know, as the saying goes, you're robbing Peter to pay Paul um, though, with those low jobs and trying to afford daycare. And in my situation, I couldn't call baby daddy. You know, baby daddy was barely paying child support. And when I would get the nerve, oh, the nerve of me, you know, to ask, you know, for a few dollars for, oh, he's had a growth spurt. You know, we need new shoes or we need socks or, oh, it's school season, you know, back to school. You know, I couldn't ask for money. You know, I couldn't ask for no type of assistance. That was my reality, you know, and so... For a while, you know, before I found my village, I only had me to depend on, you know, and and that was a a hard, tough place to be in. Um, But again, like you brought up something very important because that's not everybody's reality. You know, some people even have a village, you know, they have their families that are helping them and they still haven't figured it out, you know, so you know, both, I think all those perspectives, that's why I want to start having these conversations. That's why I hope that, you know, raising my man child can just be, you know, just a tool to help some of these conversations happen because you don't know what you don't know. You know, since we've been talking these last few weeks, well, really, shoot, since COVID started and we started having these calls, like, We've discovered so much that we didn't know about each other, you know, things that we had been dealing with. We've even discovered new ways that we need each other, you know? And so I'm hoping that raising my man child can be kind of a catalyst to kind of start some some conversations that can kind of, you know, fill in the gap, you know, for different people in different circumstances, but help all the same. Right, right. 
when you made a comment about it took you a while to find your village, what advice would you give to the single mom out there who is in, in that current state where they have isolated themselves? They feel like they are alone in order to not go through that, uh, that I guess, being in isolation for so long because they are kind of keeping everything to themselves, feeling like they're dealing with it alone. What advice would you give to that single mom in trying to find their village? Um, try to do whatever work necessary um, to be open to help. You know, I went through, once I did, once I, you know, once God started putting people in places to be able to help me, you know how it is. Like, you don't want to be a burden. Like, that's kind of how we've been conditioned. You know, you you got to be strong. You got to appear to be strong and resilient. You know, if for no other reason, we're Black women. You know, we can handle anything. You know, <laughs> but the reality is you need people. This life, life period is not designed for us to be able to do it alone. Like we can't, you need help and it's okay to need help. Of course, you know, as a single mom, you gotta be protective. You gotta have some type of discernment about who you allow into your life and you know, who you allow to be around your kids and to have that influence. But you gotta be open to letting people come in and, you know, really prove themselves in a sense, you know? let people help you, you know, people who are open to helping, helping you let them. And that's okay. That doesn't make you weak. You know, that doesn't make you less than, you know, it's, it's a part of life. We all need somebody. We need our village. We are only as strong as those we have around us supporting us. You need a support system because otherwise you'll get burnt out. And if you remain isolated, then you stay stuck. You stay whatever mental um, demons you're battling, you're going to continue to battle them because you don't have anybody pouring into you. And even if you're trying to pour in, into yourself, like we said, life don't always work out the way we want it to just because we've made up our mind that we are going to do better, have better, doesn't mean it's going to happen overnight. You know, so you need reinforcement. You know, and that comes from your village. But in order to establish that village, you've got to be open. I love that. I don't want to take from your open. I promise you, I don't want to take away from your open. But um, I know that um, I, when I moved to Maryland, it was like a really kind of hesitant thing to go and try to you know, I, there were people that were helpful. There were people that was there and it was hard because you also want to be, you want to be friendly, you want to be nice, but you also want to be cautious because there are also predators out there who are waiting for those people who are already to open up. And so um, I want to say that even though I was in Maryland, I was by myself with the uh, the one and then my, my the uh, the well, the baby daddy turned into be a, my husband but it was still us by ourselves and even when we wanted to do the whole like date night or something like that we couldn't because we really were like we can't really like let him go with just anybody and so don't like eventually we got to know one family one person and she was amazing and she helped us out a lot while we we're there so when you do find that person it is a real gift but it takes a lot for you to 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 want to open up and let, let your baby go with somebody else because the world is crazy and so even though we will be open be also precautious and give that relationship time because even though what you're saying is really true because we are, as women of color, it's really hard <laughs> for us to let it go, but um, some people do kind of let go a little too easily. And so to save the poor children out of the world, let's just make sure that we are cautious and we make a relationship out there, please. 
are absolutely right. And we get to that a little later on in the book. I'm talking about that. You're absolutely right. That's why I said like, you got to definitely be protective, you know, and have some sense of discernment because you're right. Like it's our sole job as parents to, you know, protect our babies, you know, until, and, and even after, you know, they are old enough, you know, to really protect themselves. Like God has given us this one major job and, you know, nobody wants to screw it up, you know? And sometimes things happen that are out of our control, you know, that make us feel horrible, you know, and you have to deal with that too, but you're right. And I would even add to that, don't let anybody make you feel bad or a type of way or uncomfortable about being protective, not even with relationships, but just with the people you have around your children in general, you know, yes, you can't have, there, there is no reward without risk, right? So you got to find a way to be open. Yes. But you're absolutely right. Like you got to have some boundaries. You've got to have some structure to it and, and being protective and being cautious is definitely extremely important. I agree with you. One thing that I wanted to add about the village is that you have to, and this is, this is like way far back, um, but you've got to be cautious about the people. I mean, you've got to be cautious about yourself at times too. Because I know that this is something that people don't normally talk about, but I had postpartum and I didn't talk to anybody about it, but my family, because they were in town, started recognizing that I was not myself, you know? And then when you kind of step outside of who you are, it's hard to see what's going on, you know? So you have to, it, I mean, it was one of the toughest times in my life to say that I wasn't able to do it by myself. And other people had to tell me, okay, you're not doing a good job. But I had to be able to receive that from the people who loved me most and move forward, you know? And it takes a lot because I didn't just go through postpartum, postpartum but when my dad passed, I went through a slight depression. So it's kind of like you, you go through these things through life and you've got to, recognize what you're going through yourself in order to release and move forward because I would not have been able unless I recognized what I was going through I would not have been able to move forward into my next level of life you know so I know that doesn't have as much to do with this chapter but I think that it's important that people know that regardless of once again what people see from the outside they never know what's going on within your story so I do, I really appreciate you sharing your story because it allows me to speak on my story and it'll allow other people to have these kind of conversations within their circle. Right. I, um, a few, maybe about a month ago now, um, in my therapy session, we talked about, um, so I've been kind of revisiting grief, um, as oddly as it sounds, um, you mentioned- Wait. You know, Hold on. You said as oddly as it sounds, why do you think people would say that that's odd? Well, because, well, for me, you know, my parents have been gone, you know, a long time now. I dated in the 17, you know, I lost my mom three years before I had him. I lost my dad three years before she passed, you know, so it's been a long time. And even I thought that, you know, I, I didn't have deep levels of grief anymore. And in therapy, like, I'd be so broke down, y'all. <laughs> Don't it be like, how you tap into that? How you, how you pour it, like? It's crazy. Like, it'd be, like, the, the mention sometimes, like, I just break down. And it's like, oh, my God, where is this coming from? But in some of those conversations, I kind of had this revelation that, Looking back and knowing what we know now, all the extra research that has been done, I can, I can clearly say that I had quote, postpartum. I didn't know about it then, you know, again, that was doing my period of isolation. You know, I, I think, and I've said it plenty of times, like Jaden's first year of life, like I believe I cried more than he did. Um, I spent 
many of days, you know, my house will be dark, dark, curtains pulled, just call me a vampire. You know, of course, I've always loved to sleep, but just like anytime I could, just, I just want to sleep, you know, because when you sleep, you don't have to deal with your problems. <laughs> um, but looking back and knowing what we know now, like that's something that I can relate to. Like I can clearly see that girl and say, she's dealing with postpartum. She don't know it. She don't know what to do about it. You know, but that was something else that was adding to my pot, you know? that was making the fact that I was in constant turmoil with my baby daddy and his then other girlfriend, well, girlfriend, I wasn't his girlfriend at that, that time. Um, but I got these two people that are constantly calling me. We constantly arguing back and forth. And at that time, my sole objective was just simply to be right and to be louder and you know to get back at every insult like I wasn't thinking about my mental state and how it affected my child and what I was already dealing with like I said I didn't know nothing about postpartum you know I wasn't thinking about the fact that my mom had died three years ago and now I have my first child and I can't call her to ask questions you know he's crying I think he got gas I can't call my mom and get no old remedies you know I wasn't thinking about all that. I was just in my anger and wanted to be right and wanted to prove to them that I wasn't weak, you know, and that I could stand up to them and I could handle them. And so I didn't have time to deal with postpartum, even if I knew what it was, you know, but that's important. And now, thankfully, you know, I can possibly see another girl young, maybe at 23, shoot, maybe even 30, 35, you know, and dealing with that type of conflict. And I can call out some things for her and, and be that village, like you said, because it always not, the support isn't always going to be nice or pretty with the bow on it. Sometimes they're going to have to say to you, you're wrong. I was isolated. So when I was doing all the arguing and back and forth, I had nobody to say, stop. You know, those things matter. Like that would have probably cut the time that I spent, the energy that I spent putting into that. So you're right. Like we need our village for that too. Sometimes you need somebody to say, you ain't on your, you ain't on your stuff. Let's get it together. Or you're just not being yourself. Right. You're like this is not you. And for right. people to say, this is not you, sometimes it's really hard to, to take in because you're like, wait, but I, I'm looking in the mirror and I see me, but mm -hmm. it's not about what you see in the mirror when you're going through those tough times. It's about what you feel on the inside. It's about what your head is constantly replaying. It's about your responses to what's going on around you because your responses say a lot, you know? Um, and I think that that's what it was for me. My family, my sister, and my mom saw my responses to what was going on around me to say, something's not right. We need to lean in. Now, they didn't come in and say, hey, you have, hey, you have postpartum because they're not therapists. They don't know. They were just like, you're not yourself. We're going to come over for the next 10 days just to make sure you're good. You know, because if you're the person that's on the outside and you're looking at somebody saying, you're not yourself. It's not your job to go in and say, hey, you have postpartum. It's right. your job to say, you look like you need support. Let me be there for you. Right. And that was what I had with them. And then when I reflected, I was able to say, hey, I think that, you know, I had postpartum. Yeah. So you talked about child support. Um and how you did not have child support and how that affected your, basically your response to life, because that is big when you're, when you're doing it by yourself. Um, one piece of advice that I can give just being on a different side of it was that we did not have court mandated child support, but before, while my child was in my belly, we sat down and wrote out a contract, period. And there was no change in it. The only thing that changed my child is 13 years old. The only thing that changed our contract was COVID. That was the only thing that has ever thrown a wrench in the plan. So we'll see how we do moving forward. 
but it kept <laughs> us from switching holidays. It changed the money because we started getting stimulus. You know, like all mm-hmm. those things kind of put put a wrench in the plan that we had for years, but it also kept us on a straight and narrow. So there was never any emotion about it. And that was what we did because we were cordial um, from the beginning. Uh, and I won't go into the rest because it's being recorded. <laughs> I mean, that's great. Like that encourages me to hear stuff like that. Like I'm never going to be the person to be like, you know, well, that was you, you know, that ain't my story. Like that ain't what I had to deal with, you know, like stuff like that encourages me because, you know, even though, you know, my child is about to be aged out um, of child support, you know, we've had years where you know child support has been consistent for a few months we've even had maybe one or two years maybe even three years where child support has been consistent give or take one or two months all year now we've had years like even recently i haven't received child support in the last two years you know in the beginning it was years even after our you know court appointed child support that i received it um the 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 amount has been the same in 17 years um it, different story for a different day uh, <laughs> for me in the beginning i was real angry um in the beginning i was like of course like most people would you know like where my money at <laughs> where's my money (laughs) but like I wrote in the book like what I had to what I had to come to what worked for me let me say that what worked for me was getting to a mental state of deciding that at the end of every day I'm my child's mom he looks to me for all his needs, whether anybody decides to give me $5 or $100. I got to make it happen. And so my, my downfall in the beginning was relying on that child support and honestly using it as an excuse for a while. You know, I can't pay my bills for months at a time because I'm including this amount in my income and I shouldn't have been doing that. You don't know what you don't know. But once I got to a better mental space and I decided that, you know, I wanted more out of life for other reasons, that was a part of it too. I need to get to a position for myself and for my child, everybody else excluded, despite whether that comes in or not that I still can provide for us and then I don't have to be angry now that don't mean I don't have no emotions attached to the fact that you ain't doing your part financially you know I gotta be real (laughs) that don't mean that I ain't gonna have some slick to say that don't mean that I talk real bad about you (laughs) you know I do (laughs) that don't mean that for the last two years I've been like <laughs> but you can roll up in old nineties, but you know, I, I, you know, I can be petty, you know, but no matter how much I want to, I can't make you, I can't make you do that. I can't make you be consistent in that area. And so it doesn't do anything, but emotionally wear me down, which is going to be a direct effect on my child is going to be a direct effect on our household if I'm still relying on it. So I just had to get to the place to where I tried my best to get in a position to where I was making enough to pay for men and Jaden's needs and not have to rely on the child support. That was what worked for me. That might not be what worked for what works for the next person. You might still need that but that goes into what you said you said changing our perspective about how lack shows up 
in our life is a game changer. And I have the same thing because I may have had the financial, um, the financial piece of it, but Bryson's dad lives in Chicago and has for a long time. So there were so many other things that I felt was missing um, in Bryson's life that I had to then start changing my perspective because I'm going to be there regardless. You know, no matter what happens, <laughs> if Bryson has the game, guess who's going to be there? If Bryson has this, guess who's going to be there? You know, so once I started changing my perspective, then my frustration with what was going on in the situation changed. It wasn't a financial lack. It was something that Bryson said to me when he talked about the struggles that he was having as a child. And I was like, you don't want for anything. <laughs> what do you want? He said, have you ever had your daddy live in a totally different state? At eight, when an eight-year-old says that, you're like, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have. But I had left, I had abandoned my emotions about what, what that felt like because at the time I was 16. So mine was totally different because at 16, you're a totally different person than you are when you're eight. And, you know, it's just a different situation. So, um, so that like changing your perspective on about lack is big because lack comes in so many different areas of life. You're right. That was good too, girl. You better come on, baby. That's all, Bryce. You know how you do. Keep us on our toes, right here. <laughs> well, sadly, we are running up on the end of chapter five. Gladly, because it's almost eleven o'clock at night, and we all got to go to the schoolhouse tomorrow because ain't nobody. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> but we are running up on the last paragraph. And I would love to hear, LaToya, if there is anything from you that you would like to share about that, um, about that. Oh, before you say that, I do want to say that Adrian talked about the testimony piece of it. And I just, I love that she already touched on that, that if you didn't have those tests, you wouldn't have the testimony. Um, I think that that is huge because I feel like whatever we have gone through, we're able to share it with those younger moms or those older moms because people having babies at 50. Not around here, because we getting rid of that stuff. But <laughs> but we do have moms that are out there that are having babies at an at a later age and they are single um, and younger moms who are still having babies because this earth still gotta be populated. It's kind of weird. Sorry. <laughs> um, the one thing that I would um highlight from this chapter um, is just that importance of um, fighting to change your perspective. Uh, one of the things that we didn't get into, and again, it's one of those things where you don't have to be a single mom to get something from this. Like we got to learn how to, when we deal with behavior, um, we, we talk about redirecting, you know, um, that positive redirection. Right? It's the same. It's the same for bad habits. It's the same for bad situations. Like you've got to learn how to positively redirect. You got to redirect your perspective and your focus. Instead of focusing on the fact that you might be having to live with somebody right now because I've been there. Instead of focusing on the fact that you know, last month, maybe your utility bill got cut off. You know, it might've been cut off for two days. And you might've been able to get the money that day, but you had to borrow it from somebody. Instead of focusing on, you know, I, ain't, I don't have a ride to the store, you know, focus on the things that are lining up for you. Focus on those small wins because they're still wins. And the more we focus on the positive things, be it little or big, we're going to start to attract more positive things. Um, and that's what a changed perspective will do for us, whether it's talking about lack, whether it's talking about baby daddy ain't pay his child support in six months, and I'm trying my best not to blast him on social media 
or show up at his door if he live in the same city as me, like whatever that negative energy is, you've got to learn how to positively redirect it. That's the only thing that's going to start you to change your course. That's good stuff. That's good stuff. And I hope that we all take that away tonight in multiple aspects of life, not just with relationship to our, uh, I mean, in relation to our children's fathers, our kids, just every aspect of life. Cause a change perspective is a changed life. Right. Thank you so much for taking the time tonight, ladies. Y'all are amazing. I can't wait to get this stuff posted. <laughs> no, I feel it. Y'all are coming with some bomb perspective too. I'm excited. <laughs> well, you know, girl. 